I normally feel a riff is coming because I dig myself into the data. And I think that marketers should be there, right? Like you should be not only in your marketing land data, but like all of that is truly feeding some type of revenue for your company. You should be ingrained in company level metrics. This is The Anonymous Marketer, a podcast where we tackle the biggest questions from the B2B marketing community. But instead of bringing on guests for a quick chat, every question comes from an anonymous source. These are the questions B2B marketers have but are afraid to ask. Let's start the conversation. Hey, I'm Nick Bennett, and I'm excited to get into this episode and dive into some of the new anonymous questions that we received. But before we get into it, I wanted to do my part and highlight our supporters. How does your organization equip sellers with skills, knowledge, and content to confidently engage buyers and win deals? Well, let me tell you about Alego. It's the future of sales enablement. And with Alego's sales enablement, learning and content management and conversation intelligence products, you can accelerate the performance for sales and other teams. Nearly 1 million professionals use Alego to equip sellers with intelligent training, coaching, and content that engages and converts buyers. Visit alego.com to learn more and schedule a demo. If you're a marketer, it's likely you have attribution data spread across spreadsheets, your CRM, your marketing automation platform, and other places. With data all over the place, it's hard to understand what drives the highest quality leads. And that's why I wanna tell you about HockeyStack. After adding one single line of code to your website, HockeyStack gives your company the ability to turn your marketing, sales, revenue, and product data into a unified picture. HockeyStack provides the analytics and attribution data your B2B company actually deserves. Get a free trial, and in five minutes, you can start using the product. Sign up today at HockeyStack.com. What's up, everyone? Welcome to The Anonymous Marketer. I'm your host, Nick Bennett. Today, we're going to explore a few questions around managing your role as a marketer through different economic environments. Very timely, as we see on LinkedIn every single day, stuff is happening. Not good stuff, by the way. And I have a special guest with me, my dear friend, Kaylee Edmondson. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So to get us started, let me talk about how we got these questions. So the two questions today came from our website. And in order to submit a question for the show, go to motionagency.io slash anonymous. You'll see a form where you can submit your most pressing questions. And let me just be upfront with you. Like there is like 40 questions in there and like they get real deep. So we're going to have content forever. But the reason I grouped these questions together is because they deal with uncertainty in today's world. And they deal with, again, like career growth, which we talked about in episode one, but it goes way beyond that. And I feel like Kaylee, she has such an interesting perspective and she doesn't hold back, which is why I love her as well. So Kaylee, I'm excited to jump in. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm honestly just so excited that you're creating this space and this forum for marketers and I guess anyone who wants to participate to to come forward in a like a comfortable space where you can be anonymous and rena- remain unnamed. But honestly, just to ask all the questions, you know, we're all dying to ask and get other people's advice and perspectives on. So I hope anything that I say is helpful today, but honestly, just excited to facilitate the conversation with you. Amazing. Thank you. And so let, let's jump into this first anonymous question. So a couple things that I like to do is give a little bit of background around this anonymous source. And so when you submit a question, I capture the, the, the size of company, the size of the marketing team, just so we can all relate. Okay, cool. This is the type, type of company that fits my profile so I can relate more versus a 20,000 person company. So the first question, this person works for a B2B tech company in the healthcare industry. Haven't had a healthcare que- industry question before, so this is fun. This person works on a marketing team of 10 people. So decent sized marketing team. The Alice marketing team was 10 before we had a layoff, which We'll get into that as well. But let me let me tell you the question. So the question is, after your company lays off 10 to 20% of staff, how do you change your approach to the role that you have? It's, you know, before I go into to passing it to Kay, like this is something that I feel like every day on LinkedIn, we're seeing more and more of it happen. And it's unfortunate. 
but let's let's see if we can help some people. So Kaylee, what kind of experience do you have with layoffs in your career? Things that you've seen, advice, you know, initial reactions, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think like to your point, plus one to everything that you've said, obviously every day we hop on LinkedIn these days and it seems like someone is going through a riff or a restructure or a mass layoff, whatever you want to call it or frame it as. Like nonetheless, somebody's left behind to try and pick up the pieces. And it seems like that's what this person is experiencing as well, going from what, say it again, 10 to... Yeah. So it was 10 to 20% of the staff of the company. Yeah. Um, and I mean... Health healthcare is an interesting one because I feel like that's pretty important in today's world, but I don't know. Right. I feel like healthcare is like maybe the one thing I'm not going to say recession proof because I feel like everybody's saying that there's just nothing. But I feel like healthcare is the one thing that should remain fairly constant. So that's that's definitely interesting. Mm-hmm. As far as experience with layoffs in my career, I honestly, I feel like I joined this startup grind at a really fortunate time in the timeline, right? So I started my career post uh, 2008 recession. And honestly, for startups, that's been pretty like up into the right hockey stick growth ever since until this year. So just this year alone, I have not personally been impacted by layoffs, but I do get really close for better or worse to the people that I spend the majority of my day with working alongside and have been affected by one, two, I guess, three, three riffs. And it's tough. It is tough. And it's, it's interesting because I've, I've actually have been impacted by layoffs, unfortunately, twice right now. And so it's, it's something where I remember the first time it was actually, I was um, working for a fiber optics company and I was doing channel marketing for them. And it was like back when like you had to be in person for your jobs. Mm-hmm. And like I, I was in the office and I remember my boss calls me in and was like, hey, we have to have a conversation. I was like, cool. I just thought she wanted to talk to me, tell me I was doing a good job or something. And she starts like bawling her eyes out. I was like, "Uh oh, I don't know where this is going. I was still young at the time. At the time, I was probably like 23. And wow. so she starts to cry and she's like, listen, I, I, I need to lay you off. And I was just, it's never that, that I didn't even really know what that meant. I've heard right. of it, but I, it's never happened to me. And so I was like, uh, okay. So like, what does that mean? And like, she's like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I'm a very go with the flow type of person. So I was just like, eh, you know, whatever it is, what it is. Like, don't, don't be upset about it. I get it. And she's like, you know, we're going to give you a little bit of severance and we're going to, do some other things. And um, I had to go talk to HR after that. And that was the first time it ever happened. And then it happened again, probably about six or seven years later. And at that point, working for for startups, and especially tech companies, I felt like, all right, cool. It's like, it's a a risk reward thing. You join these startups for high, high reward, but it's also high risk. And you know that you could lose your job tomorrow. Everyone is technically replaceable at, at some point. And so it's happened to me twice. And it's, it's been, it was a bummer. But I can tell you, I have came out better both times on the, on the other side, which is awesome. And the initial reaction after the layoffs occur, like, to be honest, it sucks. It's like, wow, like, does this company think that poorly of me? And right. you don't you don't associate it with like, hey, the business is going through some things or or right. whatever. And it's it might be above you. You just were impacted because of that. And I, I'm curious on your thoughts around like, and I know it hasn't specifically happened to you, but for people that you know and people that you're close to, you know, what do you feel like that initial reaction after layoffs occur? And even like, I mean, I've also been at companies where we've had to unfortunately do layoffs and I was one of the people that were left Left behind. behind. I think there's real power, like there's real feelings for both and they're very, like, I feel like the initial thoughts are very opposite ends of the spectrum. But after, you know, you go through the stages of like realization and getting more, like at first you feel like this can't be real, right? And the closer you get to understanding like, okay, this is a real event, this has actually happened, I feel like whether you were the one impacted or the one staying behind to try and figure out how to pick up the pieces, your feelings actually almost end up like blending in the same Venn diagram. I think that for people that are impacted, I'm sure they feel probably similarly to you, right? Like, oh, this has to be me. This is a performance thing. Like, I should have done more. I should have been better. 
And I think like one of the most important things to try and remind yourself in those first, especially like 20, I feel like the first 24 hours are like that phased period where you're just like trying to convince yourself this is real. Really to convince yourself that it's not, it has literally nothing to do with you. I think that Un, like I unfortunately, this is like the thing I absolutely hate about leadership is that I have been in those rooms when we are like having planning sessions around how we're going to roll things out and making those decisions. And honestly, it has nothing to do with the individual at like any of those conversations I've been in. It's never a performance conversation. It's always a business conversation. And that's why I'll never be a CEO like market here. I don't have that you know, it's really hard for me to like not be emotional and not get connected to the human side of this. But at the end of the day, if you're somebody that's impacted, I'd say 98% of the time, it has nothing to do with your actual performance. It's just a business decision that probably comes down to how long you've been here, how senior you are in your role today, and how much they're paying you. Yep. Right? Yeah. And then, 100%. Yeah. And then opposite end of the spectrum, survivor's guilt is real. So for all of the people that are left behind, and I feel like this, you know, this anonymous marketer must be le like one of those that's left behind, survivor's guilt is so real. And I think that's always my first like several days of feeling is just like, like, okay, but why, why wasn't it me? Why wasn't I chosen? Like why, like, you know, why was I chosen to stay instead of being one to leave? It's hard for those that are left behind too. And then you need to, you know, for me, it's like action mode always makes me feel better, right? Like, how can I get public, get visible, share this online, help those that are impacted, start making lists of recs that are open, right? I think that it, it kind of helps like close the door a little bit to know that you can truly help those that did get impacted or affected by a riff or a reduction to figure out what their next home is. And to your point, help them find somewhere that's even better, going to help them thrive even more than maybe the situation they were in with you at the company. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, I'll completely honest, like we actually just went through this at Alice. And so we had a 10 person marketing team and we decided that like, listen, like we need to focus more on the retention side of the business. And so unfortunately, we're going to go from 10 marketers down to four. And so, you know, you know, a couple of those people just left on their their own free will because they they wanted to go and do different things. Sure. But I mean, we we lost uh, an, an event marketer that was absolutely brilliant. We lost our VP of marketing, our senior director of revenue marketing, a product marketer, our entire design and creative team. And it's like, how do you pick up the pieces at that point? Because I'm left, we have three other marketers left. And so like the way that we're functioning now, it's like, I'm handling the evangelism and customer marketing. We have one person doing content and SEO, one person doing product marketing, and one person doing growth, which for us is paid and organic. But there's so many other things that we need to do. And it's like you're trying to pick up the pieces. And I've actually told leadership that we need to be doing less at this point, unfortunately, because things are going to fall through the cracks. And like, yeah, would we like to do 30 different things? Absolutely. But those 30 things will be half-assed when you could do these five things and do them extremely well. And I'm curious on, on your thoughts on that because it feels like this person's in a similar kind of place. Like, how do you, how would you change the way that you approach your role? Do you try to fly under the radar or do you be more um, vibrant and just out there? Oh, that's such a good question. I feel like, so... You know, with a reduction of of any size, if people directly around you on your team are also impacted, I think that, you know, after you have processed as best you can and help those that were impacted and want like st try to start picking up the pieces and moving forward, for me, like one of those first has to be first steps is to have an honest and direct conversation with whoever your manager is that might be the manager you had before the riff. Maybe you're already pretty close and connected with that person, or it might be a straight up new manager that you've never worked with. But either way, I think that has to be one of the first conversations around, okay, like we, you know, we've both been impacted at the end of the day, that manager has been impacted in some way too. This will be a new structure, a new working flow. So hopefully that means they can also empathize with right sizing expectations. If we had 30 people before, we have 10 people today, it should be pretty obvious mathematically that like, 
we now have fewer working hours in the day and fewer bodies to put towards projects and programs. But having a direct and honest conversation in early days, I feel like will only help set you up for success to identify what your, you know, maybe your new, you've got new swim lanes, you've got broader, um, like more generalized areas of ownership versus, you know, maybe the, the gig you were in before the riff. If anything, it could also very well set you up for success to have greater ownership, greater stake in the game. Maybe this could be your opportunity to break outside of whatever role that you were operating in and take on more ownership, more opportunities, strive to try and make something positive out of something that is obviously really, really negative for for everybody involved. Those con- those conversations are, are so, so huge. And like, I don't think people should be afraid to, to have those conversations because it's not like this was just kind of something that happened. And if you're not having honest and, and at times difficult conversations, it's it, you're setting yourself up for, for failure over time. What's going to happen is you're going to possibly get into a negative headspace and you're going to kind of like figure out like, okay, like, I don't know if I can actually do this now. Like this is too much weight on my shoulders. I'm worried about burnout, um, all of these other things. And I feel like, Another thing, this is this is an interesting one, like how you talk about it in a public nature. So like take LinkedIn, for example, because I feel like a lot of people talk about these things on LinkedIn, but I feel like not always leadership teams are talking about it on LinkedIn. And I'm curious, like, how do you talk about this on LinkedIn or even with like other colleagues? Like, do you just kind of brush it off or like, do you come out and be like, like, you know, hey, I want to support you or like, hey, yeah, this sucks that it happened, but the future is bright and I'm 100 percent on board. Like, I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think to to put it really tactically, obviously, I I have been surrounded by this this year by several different companies. Like one of those that is clearly like near and dear to my heart was these Chili Piper layoffs that happened a couple of weeks back. Although I wasn't at Chili Piper when the layoffs happened. Like I said earlier, for better or worse, these people really do become my family. We spend a lot of time together. We're in the trenches. We're traveling, you know, and doing offsites and meetups. Like these people are my friends. Um, and so many of them that were impacted, I'm still very much like in connected Slack channels with them. We're riffing on marketing tactics. We're like, you know, still very close in the day to day. They were impacted and a lot of them were let go. Um, my Honestly, my first reaction was to go and post on LinkedIn very transparently. And I think I just said, like, today was hard or today sucked or something. And it's like, that's just honestly how I was feeling. And all with the goal to try and create a better sense of awareness and help them. I think that they're, especially startups, maybe this isn't true for every industry, but we've all really leaned into the power of building in public. And for me, that's like wins and fails. I understand that like, you know, layoffs are like or restructures are likely for the greater good of the business, which is positive. But like for everybody that's affected, it's super negative. So that's a loss in my mind. Right. And I think we have to get comfortable with sharing the wins and the losses, because at the end of the day, like most of the people that were impacted from Chili Piper have actually already found their feet again. And I don't know that that would have happened if they would have secl- like, you know, secluded themselves or become more quiet and not. Just been open and honest, like, hey, look, this sucks, but I got impacted today. Like, I'm looking for work. Here are my skills. How can I help? It really has helped them, like, find their footing probably far faster than the traditional, like, let me go apply for a job. Let me update my resume. Let me submit it wildly to hundreds of places and hope that, like, one HR recruiter, like, sifts through the things and finds me, right? Like, that way of working is also just, like, antiquated and a little outdated. And so... If you like feel comfortable enough ripping off the Band-Aid and sharing it in public, I would obviously recommend that. As far as the point about leaders not doing it, I don't know why they don't do it. I think that because it looks poorly on them, right? Like they're more connected to the brand, the vision, the strategy, et cetera. So it's harder for them to commit to posting fails online. But I just don't see much bad that can come of it. Either you share your news yourself or someone is going to subtweet you on LinkedIn or wherever, and share your business for you. And there's no telling how they are going to interpret 
what they think happened. So instead, I think you should just like take that control yourself and share your story from your, you know, from your perspective and then use your network to help all the people that you had to let go. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with you there. It's, it's, it's a good point, which actually I think kind of brings us into the, the next question. This person works at a software company, don't know the industry, um, but it works, they work on a marketing team of four, which was actually recently cut in half. So the question mm-hmm. is, my company just laid off 30% of their staff, a large percentage in HR and in marketing. I was on a team of eight. We are now reduced to four. My boss in one of my direct reports was laid off. So now I'm forced to do the work of nearly three people. How do I approach this with management? And Mm -hmm. uh, this is, this is, this is a, this is a tough one. And like, I I feel like when you're doing the work of three people, one, you're you're probably not being compensated for that. First off. No, you're definitely not. You're definitely not. (laughs) And it's like, you know, it's, and that's, that's the thing. It's like, I feel like in a weird crazy way like these businesses and companies actually you know they lay off and they save money on the bottom line but they're actually making out because they're getting one person to do the job of three to four people and they're like wow like great now i don't have to backfill these roles i don't have to pay these Mm -hmm. people crazy amounts of money today so i'm curious you know if this happened to you like what is the first steps that you'd take in the situation if you're now expected to take on the workload of three individuals yikes Honestly, I think that's so tough. I, it goes back to this conversation, right? Like same advice for the for the first anonymous person. Like I, you have to have that conversation. And like quite honestly, like maybe these three jobs that you're now going to try and inherit aren't even things you want to do. Maybe they're things you're not good at. You don't find joy doing them. You're not passionate about learning, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not to say like don't become passionate about like stepping outside of your box, but maybe it's like a totally different scope somewhere you didn't see your career headed and you're you don't think it will actually benefit you to try and adopt all of those uh, like workloads and processes and projects and whatever. I think that's a real thing you're going to need to like work through on your own. Like, is this even something I am up to do? If not, like maybe it's also your time to walk, start looking, right? Do it on your own terms, kind of drink the Kool-Aid, stay there for a little while while you try and figure out what you really want to do next. But I really think it's all rooted in that initial conversation with your manager. Like, I guess oh, this person says their manager was also impacted, but you have a new manager probably. Somebody is over you. You need to go and talk to that person about, okay, let's right size some expectations. Like this is actually all the work they were doing. This is my skill set. Like how are we going to move forward? And at the end of the day, like if it isn't something that brings you joy that you're passionate about, maybe this isn't your stop anymore. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, in addition to that conversation, if you are taking on, the workload of three people. I think it's being up on uh, up in front and like honest and saying like, listen, like I'm happy to take on these additional responsibilities, but I want to be fairly compensated for for doing so. And if that manager, whoever your new manager is at that point says, unfortunately, it's not in the budget due to the recent layoffs that we had to do. One, that's a big red flag. And like, you should be like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm not going to just do this for free. And you probably should start to to look. But like, don't, don't, don't settle just because they say no, just be like, can I speak to, to someone else? Or can you go and, and double check for me? Or can we have a, a longer conversation about this? Because yeah. I do think that companies are getting away right now with people doing the job of more than one person and they're not being compensated for it. And like, it's, it's unfortunate because I've been in that situation before. And it's led to burnout. And then you're going to do, you're going to be a worse version of yourself, both in a professional setting and in a personal setting. Like imagine if you're a spouse or a husband or a wife or whatever, and you have kids and like you can't show up and be your full self because of everything that's happening at work. It's going to affect you more than you think. And like that could send you into a a, a mental, you know, downward spiral. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. And I think that, Honestly, there are probably more – this is like – I mean, this is a real situation. I think that this probably happens to everybody that's left behind where you are just expected to pick up so much workload. And it's – I think it's becoming more common, which feels good. But quite honestly, it hasn't been the norm for people to stand up and advocate for themselves in that moment, right? Like 
you're still going through survivor's guilt. You're probably processing, trying to help those that were impacted around you and also need to stand up and be a really strong advocate for yourself all within a very quick like period of time. I feel like when rifts or layoffs happen, it's all a very like catapulted timeline. And honestly, like the more that you can like lean on good peers and networking too in this moment, I really think it will help. Like honestly, Nick and I are that for each other, right? Like we riff in the background about our careers and our hopes and dreams and stuff. And it's really great to literally just have that friend that you can cold call in the middle of the day and say, oh, like I'm really going through it today. Can we please chat for a minute? Because they will be like far enough outside of all of the emotions that you're feeling and processing to be a little bit more objective with like, mm, I don't know, maybe you should do this instead. Um, but having a couple of people that are really in your corner to help fight for you. Because like, look, if you're not going through it now, you'll go through something hard in your career at some point, like whether you're in startups or SaaS or not. And to have a good team that are just like in your corner, there's like nothing, nothing better than that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And it kind of actually goes back to, to episode one and so we talked about career growth and like, ultimately, you have to look out for yourself because let's be honest, like it's, it's a business at the end of the day, just like professional sports, just like anything like you could, I could lose my job today, for example. And ultimately, I still have to look out for number one. I have a family to provide for and everything else. And if something doesn't align with what I want to aspire to or what I want to grow into then cool. Like I have to take that upon myself at that point. And I have to rely mm -hmm. on my network. I have to rely on my friends and family. And I have to have kind of like that supportive community that helps me. And it's just like anything, like we all go through like some crazy shit and it's like, you need, you need that like supportive aspect of it. it, whether it's career related, whether it's like burnout related, just make sure you have people that can support you. Cause I think that's incredibly important. Yeah. And I think too, to like be, tactical about it like three years ago I would have not had this right like I wouldn't have had a good support system I wouldn't have had well I mean okay like I'm married and I've got kids so sure I can like vent to my husband about it all day but to be honest like he works in corporate America and has no idea what I'm talking about half the time so he's great but very far removed from the like intricacies or reality of what's happening in startups ass and to put like some tactical things, things you can and should maybe go do today are like connect with peers that maybe you've worked with at previous gigs, right? Stay connected to them. I feel like I have like a pocket of adventures from each of my previous gigs where I'm like, oh my gosh, I love you. I can't live life without you. Like let's stay connected, but actually do it. Like text them once a month, call them once a month, go grab lunch, whatever that looks like and start posting things on LinkedIn. Like you don't have to post every day. You don't have to do all of that. But like, I feel like when I broke that wall and started sharing, there are so many people out there that, you know, either think very similar to me or think very opposite of me. Both I'm very attracted to because it only helps me grow. And it really does help start to form this nice like community. I feel like community is like really broad these days, but a nice network of friends that you know, like when I have this problem, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Nick. Let me call Nick. He definitely has the answer to that. Or like, oh crap, today I'm really going through like, you know, hiring manager woes. Let me call my friend Sydney. Like whatever the thing is, like I think you need to start building that network today if you aren't already like actively working on it because it really does like, it's like having an ultimate like phone a friend on like who wants to be a millionaire. You can just phone a friend whenever you want. Um, and honestly, they provide like the best unbiased advice. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with you there. It's, um, it's, it's so interesting. And I know, I know we're coming up on time. So I want to ask you just one, uh, another question around this, because I've been thinking about this too. So like, how do you feel about this situation as an opportunity? So like, what's a positive spin that this could have on your career? Because we've talked about the negatives and how to overcome the negatives, but on the other side, it could be a positive thing. And like, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it could be positive either way, right? So speaking from what experience I can kind of relate to this on my own is that obviously recently I decided to leave my last gig on my own, which is not the same as being let go or laid off. But nonetheless, I didn't have a paycheck coming, so I still was in the same boat that way and needed to figure out what I was going to do next, posted online about it. And now factually, I think I'm living my dream job. Like, 
all because I posted online. Like, now I'm at Refine Labs. Refine Labs would have never known I was on the market. They didn't have a public job rec. Nothing, right? I was super transparent about what I wanted to land next. I had, like, thought very objectively about, you know, the company attributes I wanted to find myself in for my next move. And Sydney from Refine reached out, DM'd me, and was like, hey, I actually think we need that here. Like, can we chat? And so, I mean, you know, being let go, if you're one let go and you you know what you want next and you can share publicly and, you know, DM your friends and have them amplify, like it, whatever it needs to to get some more traction, it very well might end up in the feed of your dream job, your hiring manager for your next role that, you know, lands you in something that's far greater than what you would have ever imagined yourself being able to do, right? On the flip side, if you're one of those left behind, Maybe somebody is now moved out of a role that you've been dying to 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 have, to try, to, you know, sign up for. But, you know, factually, the company just didn't have an opening at the time because there was somebody there. But now that role's open. This is your opportunity, right? Like, figure out how to make your case to whoever is now that position's, like, open hiring manager or open manager and have a conversation. Hey, I know it's like, you know, we're going through a lot. I'd love to start taking on a couple projects. I know that, you know, such and so was working on this. Can I help you, you know, carry it over the finish line, whatever that looks like. Like, that's an open lane for you to go and take advantage of it and try and make the most of it for yourself. It could very well, like, result nicely for a career progression. Yeah, it, it's it's a good point, too, because I've seen this happen in companies where someone had more of a director level title and um there was a rift that happened and all of a sudden next thing they knew they were actually vp of marketing whether they catapulted that way earlier in their career than they wanted to or maybe it just kind of like fell on their lap and i think it goes with like i mean i don't want to say like luck timing like there's a lot of things that that go into something like that but it could absolutely launch you into a spot in your career where like like, I didn't expect this to happen for five, six years down the road. And now here I am a year in at my role. And all of a sudden, I'm the VP of marketing or, or whatever the, the role is. And right. you could make an, a tremendous impact and you have a story to tell. And you go off and to find your dream job maybe a couple of years down the road. So there is positives for sure. No, I totally think there is. And I think that, you know, when you take, it's just hard. The fact of the matter is all of this is like a very deep, like tough, I know I don't want to make it feel like we're just like glossing over that, like it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows. But I really feel like for all of the like hard, difficult posts that are at least coming up in my feed today, there really are just as many people that are sharing that they're really pumped that they just got this stream job or they've got a job that they, you know, thought they would never be qualified for or never be able to snag. So, I mean, it really is like go, we're going through it in SaaS right now. And I know that like that's what's surrounding my feed. So that's the only thing I can really speak to. But for as many hard posts as there are, there are just as many people that are making it happen and figuring it out. And so, we just have to figure out how to make up, you know, pick up the pieces and make the best of it, which is always hard, but could really result in like good stuff for your future, for your for your career growth, for your life, you know? Yep, absolutely. All right, final question for you. So what should other marketers keep in mind with managing your role as a marketer through these kind of different economic environments? Like what is like two things that you would say like, hey, Go do these two things and you'll be in a better spot than you were yesterday. Oof. I think that it always hits me hard when people internally inside the company say that they didn't see it coming. Um, like if your company is getting ready to go through a riff or a layoff, it, it's always the hardest for me to internalize the people that come to me and confide and say, I just like, I didn't see it coming. I think that I normally feel a riff is coming because I dig myself into the data. And I think that marketers should be there, right? Like you should be not only in your marketing land data, but like all of that is truly feeding some type of revenue for your company. You should be ingrained in company level metrics. And I'm not saying that I'm like an economist by any matter of the, you know, or a CFO or like, you know, whatever, but you can tell when money is getting tight if you're close enough to the business metrics. And it does kind of help you say, okay, like we're doing something wrong. It could help you inform how you need to be, you know, 
moving more efficiently, moving more effectively. Marketing for, you know, obviously is um, a very expensive arm of the business because we are normally spending a lot of dollars in media budgets, programming, advertising, you name it. And if you see that things are starting getting, you know, starting to get tight, it could help inform like some of the ways that you're activating program dollars and stuff too. But we'll also help you just have a better sense on the business and the pulse of like how things are moving and operating. Um, so I'd say like one thing, like get closer to your business metrics, partner with whatever, whoever that looks like above you, around you, your peer set, whatever it takes to get to that. If your company has problems sharing business metrics, I also think that's a flag. So just keep that in mind. And then the other thing is like your network. I really can't say that like enough because I think it, it has actually done crazy things for me in my own career that I like before I was, you know, silent and like a lurker on all of these profiles, I, you know, was like, I don't get it. And the minute I ripped off the Band-Aid, it's seriously like I have so many really great, brilliant, talented friends that I would have never had before. And truly, it has helped me land this job. So, yeah, start building a network, whatever that looks like for you. Yep, absolutely. And I think the, the going back to that first piece of that. I think building relationships within the business, both horizontally and vertically, is incredibly important. It helps you, one, it helps you get closer to the data. But like, two, you don't want to be, you know, in your little marketing world that's like, I'm just loving life and like nothing else affects me. Like if you're not building relationships, I guarantee you other people are within the business. So Perfect. that would be my my piece of advice for sure. Cool. So that is everything. Kaylee, thank you so much for joining me. I just want to encourage marketers, if you do have questions, please, 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 like, again, it's all anonymous, motionagency.io slash anonymous, submit anything. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into anything. Nothing is off the table. So Haley, again, thank you so much for joining me. This was, honestly, I had a blast. No, this was great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Anonymous Marketer. For more episodes, check us out wherever you get your favorite podcasts or visit us on the web at motionagency.io slash anonymous. And finally, this show is produced by Motion, a done-for-you podcast agency for small, scrappy B2B tech marketers. To learn how you can launch and grow a podcast for your company, visit motionagency.io.